Paul Ryan is touting his recently released anti-poverty proposal that he thinks will help to alleviate poverty in America. The proposal has an ambitious title, Expanding Opportunity in America, and it would consolidate funding, or what Ryan terms streamlined support, for 11 federal programs, including the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, Temporary Aid, for families, for needy families, or TANF, Section 8 Project-Based Rental Assistance, and the Child Care and Development Fund. The core part of Ryan's plan is something called the Opportunity Grant. States that opt in receive a single block of aid that they can determine how to use to tackle poverty. But Congressman Ryan insists it's not a traditional block grant, which gives all the money to the states to oversee and use at their discretion. Um, the, the biggest policy uh, is what we call the Opportunity Grant. Uh, the Opportunity Grant um, gives states the ability to, to conduct innovative reforms and ways to getting people from welfare to work. Uh, it consolidates up to 11 different programs into a single funding stream. Um, it's not just a loose string block grant. It is uh, the states have to do a few things. Now, block grants are nothing new. They've been around since the 1960s. Back in 1996, Congress and then President Bill Clinton changed the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, into block grant. Instead of keeping it as a federal-state partnership, it was made into the current Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program and was given to states as, in fact, a block grant. And while block grants may offer a certain level of flexibility for states, there is also the understandable concern on how to ensure accountability for both spending and outcomes. So this um, proposal, let's just start with the likelihood that it ever becomes law. Any, you know, I mean, you were saying this about NLRB, any sense about whether or not this actually becomes the thing that governs how social welfare and safety that is, is addressed. Uh, Ryan's plan is framed as a discussion draft. There's no budget numbers in it. It's, uh, it's an attempt, in fact, to get away from discussion about budget numbers and reframe the conversation, especially on the right, uh, about how to reform uh, poverty programs and uh, government aid programs. And uh, I don't think that this draft in uh, the, or, or something that looks exactly like this is ever going to become law. But what we've seen with Paul Ryan is that he is a policy entrepreneur. On the right, he is somebody who can take the Republican Party and move the party. He did this with Medicare. He's done this with his other budget plans. And so this is, uh, I, I think, uh, an interesting effort to re not just to reframe the conversation overall, but also to move his own party from thinking about how can we cut spending mm -hmm. on everything mm -hmm. to how can we make our spending better? How can we serve people better? How can we serve beneficiaries? So, so I actually really get the devolution from the federal go um, government to the state government as as making sense within the context of what I think of as American conservatism. What I don't get is the other part of the plan, where he sort of imagines these individually tailored life plans. Um, by life coach, I presume he means social worker, right? Someone who is going to make this contract with an impoverished person, and they're going to have benchmarks, and they're going to have to determine sort of, you know, when they meet these goals. That, David, sounds like a huge government program. I mean, maybe that's where the jobs will no, come it, from, it, is they will hire it, poor people to be their own life coaches? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Why can't we just talk about the ideas for a minute? Because part of the yeah. thing that I think most people decry about, you know, politics today is it seems very small and that there are no ideas and that we're all, look, everybody's kind of looking toward the next election. It's like looking toward the next quarterly profit. So today's crazy idea becomes tomorrow's policy, like electric cars or alternative fuels. So it seems to me it behooves people who are very disappointed with the state of the politics today when people do offer ideas to at least consider those ideas seriously. And one of the things that I found, uh, I, I mean, I agree with you about block grants. I mean, this is like, you know, I remember when I started covering, you know, politics, like block grants was like the first thing that I covered. So this yep. is like old school that's Reaganomics. Old, yep. So that's not that. But but the idea of reducing the paperwork burden on individuals is something that I think is important to consider. Because yes. I think the political yes. right is very, you know, is very obsessed with reducing the paperwork burden on businesses. But seems to be uninterested in the paperwork burden on individuals. But this I mean, isn't reducing the, the just, burden on poor people, but, let me just, though. But, 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 but the idea is one that has to be addressed because nobody ever talks about it. I mean, the idea that people want you to get fingerprinted and they want you to take a urine, a urine test to get food stamps. I mean, when middle class people are out of food and, or, and they run into a difficult, what do they do? Their neighbors bring them food. That's what happens. I mean, middle class people don't, or, or if they need, they get short at the end of the month, they access a personal credit line or something like that. When you have no money, and so the idea of reducing the paperwork burden on individuals is important to even to consider. Right. Just, uh, the idea of allowing people the opportunity 
you know, to, to get access to these things in a more efficient way is something that needs to be considered because nobody ever talks about process. People talk about the big ideas. They don't talk so about Michelle, how to So Michelle, what if we just went back to ideas. Nixon's idea so, and hand poor people cash? Yeah. It turns out that's a very effective and useful well, that's, method that's in what the, that's paperwork. That's what the earned income tax credit does. And so I think that's a whole You have to qualify for it. Paul, the, the Paul Ryan plan actually expands, significantly expands the earned income tax credit. And, and more fundamentally, to get back again mm -hmm. to the macro, what's Paul Ryan trying to do here? He's trying to say, the debate we've been having on the left and right is spend Spend more money, spend less money on these programs. We spend $900 billion a year on means tests and anti-poverty programs. Let's not have that debate. Let's say we're going to spend the same pot of money, but let's figure out how to spend it better. And that's a discussion that, in theory, should be less ideological. And we can just start saying, which programs work, which programs don't work. Oh, look, we don't but spend what, $900 billion. Dollars. Let's, 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 let's have Social that debate. Security, but, you know, I mean, I, and I think that's what he's trying to do. And to your point about how this is going to evolve in the future, mm -hmm. this is the first inning. I think what you're going to see is a healthy debate on the right for the next couple of years on how to put this forward, what's going to work, what's not going to work, See, I, the presidential primary. I would, I would, I would, I would actually claim that it's, that it's not the first inning, that, that in fact no. this is, this, maybe this Over back, time? Right, that, this, that, that, we, that we have actually been having, that said, thank you to David <laughs> K. Johnson and to Oprah <laughs> Boyd. Peter is coming back in our next hour. But